Hi, my name is Chelsea Mills. Welcome to 100 Stories Deep. Today I'm reading you a short story called Real Women Have Bodies, which is taken from the collection Her Body and Other Parties by Carmen Maria Machado. I chose the story today because I think it's a wonderful example of the series which explores the different relationships and experiences that a woman can have with her body. In particular, this story will explore what it means to live inside of a female body and what it means to lose one's female body. And I think it will be a wonderful read along. This is Real Women Have Bodies. I used to think my place of employment, glam, looked like the view from inside a casket. When you walk through the mall's east wing, the entrance recedes like a black hole between a children's photography studio and a white-walled boutique. The lack of colour is to show off the dresses. It terrifies our patrons into an existential crisis and then a purchase. This is what Gizzy tells me anyway. The black, she says, reminds us that we are mortal and that youth is fleeting. Also, nothing makes pink taffeta pop like a dark void. At one end of the store is a mirror easily twice as tall as I am, rimmed by a baroque gold frame. Gizzy is so tall that she can dust the top of the giant mirror with only a small step stool. She's my mother's age, maybe a little older, but her face is strangely youthful and unlined. She paints her mouth matte peach every day, so evenly and cleanly that if you look at her too hard, you feel faint. I think her eyeliner is tattooed on her lids. My coworker Natalie thinks that Gizzy runs the store because she's pining after her lost youth, which is her answer for why any real adult does anything she thinks is stupid. Natalie rolls her eyes behind Gizzy's back and always rehangs the dresses a little roughly, like they're to blame for the minimum wage or useless degrees or student debt. I follow behind her, smoothing out the skirts because I hate to see them ruffled any more than they have to be. I know the truth, not because I'm particularly perceptive or anything. I just overheard Gizzy talking on the phone once. I've seen the way she runs her hands over the dresses, the way her fingers linger on people's skin. Her daughter is gone like the others, and there isn't anything she can do about it. I really like this, says the girl with the seal hair. She looks like she has just emerged from the ocean. The dress is the color of Dorothy's shoes and has a plunging back. But I don't want to get a reputation, she murmurs to no one in particular. She puts her hands on her hips, spins around and flashes a smile. For a moment, she looks like Jane Russell from Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. And then she is seal girl again. And then she's just a girl. Her mother brings her another dress, this one gold with a cobalt shim on its surface. It's the first day of the season and there's still a lot to choose from. Bright teal slips and dusky pink thunder puff, the Bella series, the wonder color of bees, mermaid cuts in salt flat white, trumpet style in algae red, princess gowns in liver purple, the Ophelia which looks perpetually wet. Emma wants a second chance, the exact shade of a doe standing in a shadow. The banshee with its strategically shredded milk-coloured silk. The skirts curl, ruffle with layers of taffeta, except when they drag and slink. Their busts are crunchy with coral hand-stitched sequins, or studded with pebbles, or stretched with netting the colour of frosted sea glass, or neon early morning buttercream, or overripe cantaloupe. There is one that is just thousands of jet black beads in midnight black settings that moves with every breath. The most expensive dress costs more than I make in three months. The least expensive 200 down from four because a strap is broken and Petra's mother has been too busy to come fix it. Petra delivers the dresses to Glam. Her mother is one of our biggest suppliers. The Sadie's photo crew has taken to skulking around Glam's entrance to gawk at the customers and shout rude comments.
but Chris and Casey and a rotating assortment of other assholes leave Petra alone. She always wears a baseball cap over her short brown hair and tightly laced combat boots. When she's hauling the gauzy dresses wrapped up in plastic, she looks like she's battling a giant prom monster, all petticoat undersides and rhinestone tentacles with her bare hands. And that is not the kind of woman you idly mess with. Casey referred to her as a dyke once during a smoke break, but he's too afraid of her to say anything to her face. She makes me nervous in an excess salivation kind of way. We've had exactly two exchanges since I started working at Glam. The first one went like this. Do you need any help? No. And three weeks later, it must be raining, I said, as the prom dress creature trembled in her hands and the plastic sheeting sent off drops of water. Maybe if it rains enough, we'll all drown. That'll be a nice change. She's very cute when she comes out from underneath all of that fabric. The first report started at the height of the recession. The first victims, the first women, had not been seen in public for weeks. Many of the concerned friends and family who, brought into their, who broke into their homes and apartments were expecting to find dead bodies. I guess what they actually found was worse. There was a video that went viral a few years back, amateur footage from a landlord in Cincinnati who brought a video camera with him in order to cover his ass as he evicted a woman who had fallen behind on the rent. He walked from room to room calling her name, swinging the camera this way and that and making wise cracks. He had lots of things to say about her artwork, her dirty dishes, the vibrator on her nightstand. You could almost miss the punchline to the whole meandering affair if you weren't looking closely enough. But then the camera spun around and there she was, in the most sun-drenched corner of her bedroom hidden by the light. She was naked and trying to conceal it. You could see her breasts through her arm, the wall through her torso. She was crying. The sound was so soft that the inane chatter of the landlord had covered it until then. But then you could hear it, miserable, terrified. No one knows what causes it. It's not passed in the air. It's not sexually transmitted. It's not a virus or a bacteria, or if it is, it's nothing scientists have been able to find. At first, everyone blamed the fashion industry, then the millennials, and finally the water. But the water's been tested. The millennials aren't the only ones going incorporeal. And it doesn't do the fashion industry any good to have women fading away. You can't put clothes on thin air. Not that they haven't tried. During our first during our shared 15 minute break, behind the emergency exit, Chris hands his cigarette to Casey. They pass it back and forth, the smoke curling out of their mouths like goldfish. Hips, Chris said. That's what you want. Hips and enough flesh for you to grab onto, you know? What would you want to do without something to hold that's like, like, like trying to drink water without a cup? Casey finishes. I am always surprised at the poetry with which boys can describe boning. They offer me the cigarette like always. Like always, I decline. Casey grinds it against the wall and lets the butt drop. The ash clings to the brick like a bad cough. All I'm saying is, says Chris, if you want a fuck mist, I'll just wait for a foggy night and pull my dick out. I pinch the muscle between my shoulder and neck. Apparently some guys like that. Who? No one I know, Chris says. He reaches out and presses his thumb into my collarbone quickly. You're like stone. Thanks. I knock his hand away. I mean, you're solid. Okay. Those other girls, Chris begins. Man, did I ever tell you about the time I photographed a woman who started to fade? Casey says. Sadie's photo specializes mostly in children's portrait photography, handing them props and planting them in these hellish little dioramas. A farmhouse, 
a tree house, a gazebo by the pond that's actually a piece of glass surrounded by green felt. But occasionally they get teenagers, even adult couples. Chris shakes his head. When I was trying to clean up her portrait on the computer, there were all these weird reflections, like the lens was dirty or busted. Then I realized that I was just seeing what was behind her. Shit, dude, did you tell her? Fuck no. I figured she'd find out soon enough. Hey, Stone Girl, Casey shouts above the rubble of a forklift. You coming? When I come back in from break, Natalie is glowering, stomping around the interior of Glam like a tiger stalking at its cage. Gizzy rolls her eyes as I sign in. I don't know why I keep her around, she says in a dry voice. Petra will be in later with some new dresses. Don't let Natalie take off anyone's head. Natalie unwraps four sticks of gum and folds them into her mouth one at a time, rolling the mass around in there as she chews slowly and without apparent pleasure. Chris and Casey stop by, but when she glares at them, they take off like she's spitting acid. Fuckers, she mutters. I have a goddamn photography degree and I can't even get a job at Sadie's taking pictures of screaming babies. How the hell do those two assholes get to work there? She flips the hanger of the first dress she sees. The mountain blue bustle trembles. I turn it back. Do you ever wonder if the girls who come in here realize they're going to grow up exactly as fucked as we are? She says. I shrug and she flips another dress. After that, I let her reach through the empty store. I stand near the closest rack, a collection ranging from pale, silky sea foam to dust moss, dense moss, sorry. Smoothing the skirts and watching the front door. The dresses look even sadder than normal tonight, even though even more like stringless marionettes. I hum under my breath as I fix twisted sequins. One of them pops off and flutters through the air. I kneel down and press the tip of my finger to it. Then I tug at the hem so that they skim an even inch over the black carpeting. When I look up, I see a pair of combat boots, a bouquet of Technicolor skits. You getting off soon? Petra asks me. I stare up at her for a long moment, my crooked index finger bearing a gleaming sequin, and feel the heat of a blush creeping up my neck. I'm a... Done at nine. It's nine now. I stand. Petra lays the dresses gently over the counter. Natalie is back at the register, watching us curiously. Are you okay to close up? I ask her. She nods. Her left eyebrow so sharply arched, it's in danger of touching her hairline. We sit at a small table in the food court across from Glam and the ice skating rink. The mall has just closed. So the space is empty except for clerks turning out the lights and rolling down the clattering grates at the storefronts. We could get a coffee or something or she touches my arm and the shock of pleasure bolts all the way through my body. She is wearing a necklace I've never seen before. A smoky quartz encased in a tangled sprawl of copper vines. Her lips are a little chapped. I hate coffee, she says. What about, I hate that too. Petra's mother runs a motel off the highway, taken over from her father when he died a few years back. The patrons are mostly truckers, Petra explains as she drives, which is why it's set so far off the road. Between the entrance and the distant building is a tundra of thick, knobbly ice over which Petra's ancient station wagon rocks like a canoe against a lapping tide. Slowly, we move closer and closer to the motel, which looms like a haunted house. A sign on the dilapidated building next to the motel blinks through a set of letters, B, A, R, three times before illuminating in its entirety and going dark. Petra drives with one hand on the wheel, the other rubbing a slow circle on my hand. Petra parks the car along a deserted strip of spaces. The numbered doors are shut against the cold, quiet. I need to get a key, she says. 
She gets out and walks around to my side of the car. She opens the door. Are you coming? Inside the lobby, a large woman in a peach nightgown is using a sewing machine behind the counter. She looks like a melting ice cream cone, loose. Long hair spills off her head and disappears behind her back. The air is warm and soft and filled with a mechanical purring. Hey mama, says Petra. The woman doesn't respond. Petra bangs her hand on the counter. Mama! The woman behind the desk looks up briefly before returning to her work. She smiles but does not say anything. Her fingers flick like honeybees emerging from a hive on a too warm winter day, dizzy, purposeful, punch drunk. She moves a heavy piece of cotton through the machine, creating a hem. Who is this? She asks. Her eyes don't break from her work. She's from Gizzy's store at the mall, Petra says, rifling through a drawer. She pulls out a white key card and runs it through a small gray machine, pressing a few buttons. I'm going to send her back with some new dresses. Sounds good, baby girl. Petra pockets the card. We're going to take a walk. Sounds good, baby girl. Petra and I do it in room 246. Afterward, Petra pulls a blanket over me and we lie there listening to the wind. How are you doing? She asks after a while. Okay, I say. I mean, good. I wish every weekday ended like this. I'd, I'd never miss a shift. Do you like working there? She asks. I snort, but don't know how to continue after that. That bad? I mean, it's fine, I guess. I draw my hair up into a bun. It could be worse. It's just that I'm broke as hell. And it's not like this is what I wanted to be doing with my life. But a lot of people have it worse. You're very kind to the dresses, she says. I just don't like it when Natalie fucks with them, even if she's half joking. It seems, I don't know, undignified. Petra studies me. I knew it. I knew you could tell. What? Come on. She gets up and slips her shirt on, her underwear, her pants. It takes her a moment to lace her boots up as tightly as they were before. I hunt around for my shirt up for a minute before finding it trapped between the mattress and the headboard. Petra leads me through the parking lot and into the lobby. Her mother is not there. She steps behind the counter and pushes open the door. At first, the room appears strangely lit, studded with patches of iridescent blue, like will-o'-the-wisps misleading us through a swamp. Dress forms stand at attention, an army with no purpose, surrounded by long tables scattered with pincushions and spools of thread baskets of sequins, beads, and charms, an unspiraling measuring tape that looks like a snail, bolts of fabric. Petra takes my hand and guides me along the wall. We are not alone in the room. Petra's mother is hovering near a dress, a bracelet pincushion wrapped around her wrist. As my eyes adjust to the dark, the lights coalesce into silhouettes, and I realize the room is full of women. Women like the one in the viral video see through and growing faintly like afterthoughts. They drift and mill and occasionally look down at their bodies. One of them with a hard and sorrowful face is standing very close to Petra's mother. She moves toward the garment slung over the dress form, butter yellow, the skirt gathered in small places like a theater curtain. She presses herself into it, and there is no resistance, only a sense of an ice cube melting in the summer air. The needle, trailed by thread of guileless gold, winks as Petra's mother plunges it through the girl's skin. The fabric takes the needle too. The girl does not cry out. Petra's mother makes tight, neat stitches along the girl's arm and torso skin and fabric binding together as tightly as two sides of an incision 
I realize that I'm digging my fingers into Petra's arm and she's letting me. Let me out, I say, and Petra pulls me through the door. We are standing in the middle of the well-lit vestibule. A sign resting on an easel reads continental breakfast 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. What? I point to the door. What is she doing? What are they doing? We don't know. Petra begins to pick out a bowl of fruit. She takes out an orange and rolls it under her hand. My mother has always been a seamstress. When Gizzy approached her about making dresses for Glam, she agreed. The woman started showing up a few, a few years ago. They would just fold themselves into the needlework like it was what they wanted. Why would they do that? I don't know. Didn't she tell them to stop? She tried, but they kept coming. We don't even know how they know about this place. The orange begins to leak and the air fills with the bite of citrus oil. Did you tell Gizzy? Of course, but she said that as long as they sought us out, it was all right. And those dresses do so well, they sell more than anything my mother has ever made before. It's like people want them like that, even if they don't realize it. I leave the motel on foot. I walk slowly over the ice, falling frequently. Once, I turn and look back and see Petra's outline in the lobby window. My hands go numb with cold, my head aches, and I can still feel her necklace in my mouth. I can taste the metal on the stone. At the main road, I call a cab. I go to Glam early the next morning. The key is missing, my key is missing. I must have left it on the dresser at the motel, I realize, swearing under my breath. So I wait for Natalie to arrive. Inside the store, I leave her to the morning tasks and search through the dresses. They rustle beneath my fingers, groan on their hangers. I press my face into their skirts, shape the bodices beneath my hands to give them room. I wander the mall on my lunch break. I wonder about the merchandise I pass. Who's in there? The wooden picture frame samples arranged in descending Vs down a felt display case look askew, as if they've been invaded. The glass and steel chess set in the window of the game store, are those, are those re the reflections of passers-by in the fat curve of the queen and the pawns, or faces peering out? There's an ancient Pac-Man machine that takes everyone's qu quarters seemingly on purpose. I pass, I walk past the heavily scented entrance of a JC Penny cosmetic store and imagine customers uncapping tubes of lipstick and twisting the color free and faded women squeezing up around the makeup, thumbs first. In front of the Auntie Anne's, I stand and watch as the door is pulled, heavy and wet. I imagine toddlers, faded girls, they were, they were fading younger and younger, weren't they? That's what they said on the news, pressing into the dough and, yes, isn't that a curled hand? A pouting lip, a little girl standing in front of the counter asks her, her mother for a pretzel. Susan, the mother admonishes, pretzels are junk food, they will make you fat. <laughs> she drags her away. A posse of teenagers squeezes into glam after I get back. The girls pull dresses off hangers and slip them on carelessly, not even pulling the modesty curtains closed enough to conceal their dressing and undressing. When they come out, I can see the faded women all bound up in them, fingers laced tightly through the grommets. I cannot tell if they are holding on for dear life or if they are trapped. The rustling and trembling of the fabric could be weeping, or laughter. The girls spin and lace and tighten. From the doorway of the store, Chris and Casey are gnawing on slippy shores. They hoot and holler but never cross the threshold. Their mouths are stained blue. Fuck you! I run toward the entrance, a stapler's comforting weight deep in my palm. My arm is ready to sling it if I have to. Get out! Go the fuck away! Jesus! Chris says, blinking. He takes a step back. 
What's your problem? Hey, Lindsay, nice. Casey yells into the store. A blonde turns and grins, popping her hip to the side like she's about to balance an infant on it. Deep in the thick folds of the satin, I see lidless eyes. In Glam's black bathroom, I throw up everything. I can't stay, I tell Gizzy, I just can't. She sighs, look, she says, I really like you a lot. The economy is shit, and I know you don't have another job lined up. Can you at least stay on until the end of the season? I, I can give you a little raise. I, I can't. Why not? She hands me a tissue and I blow my nose. I just can't. She looks genuinely sad. She digs a piece of paper out of her desk and starts to write on it. I'm not sure how long Natalie will last without you, she says. I like Natalie. I let out a bark of laughter. Come on, Natalie is great, but she's the worst. She's not the worst. She called a customer a sanctimonious twat today to her face. Gizzy looks up at me and sighs. She reminds me of my daughter, or piss and vinegar. Isn't that stupid? What a stupid reason. She smiles sadly. Gizzy, is your daughter... Is she here? In, in the store? Gizzy turns her face away and finishes writing. She hands the paper to me. Sign this. I do. Your final check will come in the mail, she says, and I nod. Bye, kiddo. If you ever want your job back, you know how to find me. She squeezes my hand lightly and puts the pen in the drawer. Through the narrowing gap of the closing door office, office door, I see Gizzy staring at the far wall. Petra is waiting next to my car. You forgot this, she hands me the key. I take it and slide it into my pocket. I look away from her. I just quit, I say, I'm leaving. I open the driver's side door and jump and drop into the seat. She gets in next to me. Look, what do you want, I say. You like me, right? I rub my neck, yes, I guess. Why don't we go out, for real this time? She slings a heavy boot up on the dashboard. No faded women, no dresses, just I don't know, movies and food, making love. I hesitate. Promise, she says. I find a cleaning job at the local condiment factory, a late night shift. The pay is shit, but no worse than glam. One job is the same as another. I move out of my apartment and into the motel where I can stay for free. The rooms are never entirely full and Petra assures me her mother will never know the difference. I spend most of my time in the factory sweeping, mopping, walking past large rooms where hot acrid blasts of cooking wine take the air out of my lungs. Barbecue sauce is brewing and the smell saturates my hair and clothes. I rarely catch a glimpse of another human being and I like it that way. I often find myself searching the dark corners but why would they come here? I am always afraid that I will find one trying to cook herself into the mustard, but I never do. Months fall away. I consider going to grad school if the government doesn't shut the universities down like they're threatening to. We binge watch medical procedural shows and eat lo mein and kiss and make love and sleep odd hours tangled up together like coat hangers. One night, I find her standing in front of the bathroom mirror, pulling at her face in the fluorescent light. I come up behind her and kiss her shoulder. Hey, I say. Sorry, I really smell like a steak today. I'll wash up. I step into the shower. The water heats my skin and I moan from the sensation. The shower curtain rustles and Petra do joins me, her skin drawn up into goosebumps. When I leave the bathroom, drying my hair, she's lying spread-eagled on the bed and I know. I'm failing, she says. And as she says it, I can see that her skin is more like skim milk than whole.
that she seems less fair. She breathes and the impression blinks like she's fighting it. I feel like my feet are trap doors that have sprung open and my insides are hurtling out of my body. I want to hold her, but I'm afraid that if I do, she'll give way beneath my arms. I don't want to die, she says. I don't think they're not dead, I say, but the statement feels like a lie and is unhelpful in every way. I've never seen Petra cry, not until now. She brings her hands to her face, the outline of her lips visible, ever so faint, through their, na through their jail bars of tendons, muscle and bone. A shudder runs through the length of her body. I touch her, and still she has mass, a stone. A few months, she says, or something like that. That's what the news says, right? She pinches the bridge of her nose, tugs her earlobes, presses her fingers tightly into her stomach. That first night, Petra just wants to be held, so that's what I do. We line up our bodies and press them together every inch. She wakes up ravenous, for food, for me. A few days later, my eyes open at dawn and Petra is not there. I flip back the covers, stalk into the bathroom, shove the shower curtain open with a slinking rattle. A chill moves through my body and I check the drawers, the space beneath the TV, the inside of the radiator. Nothing. As the mattress creaks beneath my sinking body, she comes through the door, her shirt sticking to her through patches of sweat. She bends over and puts her hands on her knees, still trying to catch her breath. Only when she looks up does she, sh does she see me, shaking. Oh God, oh God, I'm so sorry. She sits down next to me and I bury my face in her shoulder, where she smells like loam. I thought it happened already, I whispered. I thought you were gone. I just needed to get out the into the morning, she says. I wanted to feel my running body, my body running, sorry. She kisses me. Let's do something tonight. When the sun sets, we go to the trucker bar behind the motel. The bear tastes watery and the glasses sweat. We sit at a table with pictures of fox heads and people's names carved into the scarred wood. Petra has discovered that she can pass small objects through her fingers sometimes, so she drops coins into her hand as we sip our beers. I can't watch. Let's play darts or something, I say. Petra lifts her fingers and tries to grab the quarter on the table. Her fingers pass through it once, twice, but on the third try, her hand seems to blink into the physical universe again and she gets it. She sinks the quarter into the jukebox. I ask the bartender for darts and he hands them to me in an old cigar box. We take turns throwing them at the target. Neither of us is very good and I bury one into the wall. Petra's laugh is dark and liquid. My aim has never been good, I confess. When I was a kid, we used to have a beanbag toss game that my aunt bought us, and I literally never once got a beanbag into the hole. Not a single time. We're literally, we're talking literally years of my life. My brother thought it was the goddamn funniest thing he'd ever seen. Petra stares at me. A handsome smile pulls at the edge of her mouth and then vanishes, replaced by a flattened expression. Then she says, your family sounds really nice. The word nice is like a splinter of glass. I have been picking up my phone every few days, intending to explain to my family that women are sewn into dresses and I'm working at a factory and I'm living in a motel with the daughter of, this, of a seamstress who is also dying, though not exactly dying. I can't. The last time I talked to my mother, I assured her I was solid and safe. So I confessed to her that I had to delay my student loan payments again. I made up stories about the day's clients and it must have been believable because she sounded relieved. They are, I see. Maybe you'll get to meet them one day. 
I wouldn't bother. I'm on my way out, right? Jesus, Petra, don't talk like that. And don't talk to me like that. She falls into a sullen, a sullen silence, absently picks at a zit on her chin. She finishes her beer, buys another, her dart tosses becoming less precise, yawning wider and wider from the center target. I don't like the way she is pulling the darts out of the board, like she's yanking on an opponent's ponytail. After the fourth game, her hand blinks out mid-drink and the glass falls, bare and shards of glass asterixing on the wooden floorboards. Petra walks over to the board. I can see her opening and closing her fist, feeling for substance. In the moment that matter returns to her, she rests her hand flat and palm down on the wall. Pulling the dart from the target, she plunges it deep into the back of her hand, just now, just below the knuckles. From the back of the bar, someone yells, holy shit. I crash past the table and grab Petra, though not before she has plunged a needle of the dart into her hand twice more. She's screaming. Blood streams down her hand like maple ribbons. Men get up quickly from their stools and chairs, some of which clatter to the floor. Petra flails, howling. Her blood splatters the wall like rain. A stocky man in a black baseball cap helps me, helps me drag her out the front door. I half carry, half haul her across the icy parking lot. After we have gone a few dozen yards, she seems to soften in my arms. For a moment, I'm terrified she is feeding again. But no, she's still solid, just limp with exhaustion and stubbornness. A dark trail marks the path we have taken. She refuses the hospital. In our room, I disinfect her wound, wrap it with gauze. We have never made love with such urgency as we do in these weeks, but she is fading more and feeling less. She comes in frequently. She withdraws for longer and longer periods of time. One minute, four, seven. Each episode shows a different view of her. A skeleton, ropey muscles, the dark shapes of her organs, nothing. She wakes up sobbing and I rope my arm tightly around her torso, shushing gently into her ear. She reads rumors on the internet about how you can slow fading. One message board talks about a high iron diet. So she steams enough spinach to feed a large family and chews on it wordlessly. Another recommends ice cold showers and I find her trembling and goosebumped in the bathtub. She lets me dry her off like she's a child. On a warm Sunday, Petra wants to go for a hike, so we do. Spring seizes the valley in fits and spits and today the paths through the woods are muddy. Snow melts and drips water into our hair. We follow a creek that is practically a living thing, surging messily through its own curves and bends. We take a break in a sunny clearing and eat oranges and cold chicken. Petra has taken to treating every meal as her last. So she peels the skins off the pieces of chicken and chews on them with her eyes closed, and then on the meat itself. And then she sucks hard on every bone before throwing it off into the trees. She sets, she sets each wedge of orange in her mouth reverently, as if it is the Eucharist. Bites into the meat and pulls the rinds away like hangnails. She rubs the peels against her skin. I've been doing some reading, says Petra in between pools of ice water. It turns out that they think that the faded women are doing this sort of I don't know, I guess you'd call it terrorism. They're getting themselves into electrical systems and fucking up servers and ATMs and voting machines, protesting. She still refers to them in the third person. I like that. The woods, the woods are quiet, but for the hum of insects and twittering of birds, we peel off our clothes and soak in the sun. I imagine my fingertips against the light 
pink amber halos around the shadows of my bones. I lean over Petra and kiss her bottom lip, the top, I kiss her throat. I bury my hand between her thighs. Around us, minutes inch over the dirt like ants, tumble into the swollen stream, are carried away. We find a chapel among the trees. The pews are even and rigid, and stained glass windows line the walls, or footfalls echo along the stone floor. The air is hot, and we kick up dust that weaves through the light. We sit down in a pew that groans beneath our weight. Petra lays her head on my shoulder. Do you think faded women ever die? I guess, I don't know. Or age? I shrug and press my nose into her hair. So I might be 29 for all of eternity. Maybe. You'll be haunting me when I'm 100 and you look fantastic and I'll look like shit. Nah, you'll be a beautiful crone. You'll have a cabin in the forest and there will be rumors that you're a witch. But the kids who are brave enough to get close will get to listen to your stories. She shudders so hard I feel it in my skeleton. I see movement out of the corner of my eye and I stand. In the window depicting Saint Rita of Cassia, a faded woman is clinging to the lead. Her fingers curled around the kames as if they were monkey bars. She is watching us, rocking on her heels, popping in and out of the glass as if she were threading, treading water. Petra notices her and stands next to me. In her hand, I see the votive of a prayer candle. Petra, don't. I can see her throat muscles twitching. I can set her free, she says. If I break it, I can set her free. We don't know that. Don't tell me what to do, you're not my fucking mother. I gently circle her wrist and lean into her hair. I love you, I say. It's the first time I've said it and it tastes strange in my mouth. Real but not ready, like a too hard pear. I ease the voter from her hand and slide it into my jacket pocket. I kiss her temple, her jaw. She turns into my body. I think she's going to cry, but she doesn't. I miss you already, she says. I run my hand along her back and as I do, I am certain I see a flash of my own muscle. My stomach tightens. The chicken and oranges protest. Press up, press up my es esophagus. We should go back, I say. I think it's going to be dark soon. The faded woman won't look away. She smiles. Or maybe she is grimacing. We come out of the woods like we're being born. In my room, we watch the news, our bodies curled together in the soft blue glow of the television. Pundits point fingers at each other, screaming as the co-host between them shimmers and waves under the studio lights. They are talking about how we can't trust the faded women, women who can't be touched, but can stand on the earth, which means they must be lying about something. They must be deceiving us somehow. I don't trust anything that can be incorporeal and isn't dead, one of them says. The woman blinks away mid-broadcast, a microphone tumbling to the floor. The camera scrambles to look away. Before we go to bed, I set the water from the chapel on the nightstand and light the candle. It flickers comfortingly casting the furniture against the wall like shadow puppets. I dream that we go to a restaurant that only serves soup. I can't decide what to order and she laughs and stirs the bowl she's already received. When she pulls the spoon out, there is a jelly, ghostly hand twirled tightly around the handle and she pulls the faded woman up and up. The woman's mouth is open as if she's crying out, but I can't hear anything. When I wake, I am sure Petra has gone for a run because before I realize that my hand has sunk into the luminous cavern of her chest, I tip into her completely, choke like I'm being waterboarded. She wakes up 
and screams as I flail around inside her. After a minute, we calm down. She moves away from me to the edge of the bed. We wait. Seven minutes go by. Ten. Half an hour. Is this it? I ask her. Is this it? I don't want to leave, but she is turned away from me. I stand up. She does not look at anything except her own hands. After a long time, she says, it's time to go. I cry. I slip on my boots, their heels chewed up by my uneven footsteps. I look at her there, gone, and she finally turns, and I know she can see my body, still solid enough to be lined in light, moving about the watery afterbirth of the sunrise. I close the door behind me, and I feel my nose fire on and off. Soon, I'll be nothing more too. None of us will make it to the end. Only half of the mannequins in Glam's windows are clothed. It's the end of the season. The shop will rotate soon. The stock will go somewhere. The lights go out. The, great, the gate rattles down halfway. Natalie stoops beneath it and pulls it shut. She stands up and sees me. She looks thinner than I remember. She nods ever so slightly and then takes off into the cavernous interior of the mall. I hold my old key tightly in my hand. It fits the lock. Gizzy never bothered to change it. The gate slides up loudly. The pinking shares are stuck in the back of my jeans, where I could carry a gun if I cared to. I cut the places where one thing is stitched to another. I unlace bodices. I can see them, the woman, loosened from their moorings, blinking up at me. Get out, I tell them. I tear at the hems and seams. The dresses are coming apart, looking more alive than I have ever seen them. The fabric splitting away from the form, like so many banana peels, flaps of gold and peach and wine. Get out, I say again. They are blinking, unmoving. Why aren't you going, I screamed. Say something, they do not. I pull away the panel of a bodice. A woman stares back at me. She could be Gizzy's daughter. She could be Petra or Natalie or my mother or even me. No, fuck it. You don't even have to say anything. Just get out. The gate is open, please. A flashlight beam dances over the far wall. I hear a deep voice. Hello? Who's there? I've called the police. Please go! I scream, even as a security guard tackles me to the ground. From the blackness of the floor, I see them all, faintly luminous, moving about in their husks. But they remain. They don't move. They never move. The end. So that was Real Women Have Bodies. I hope you enjoyed it. And I now challenge you to think about what it means to have a body, what, how it identifies your existence in this world, and to think about what you would do if you lost your body. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of 100 Stories Deep. Please subscribe below to follow the next episode that is soon to come. Have a great day.